great reminder that video that um, while gathered in congregational worship in a church is a good and wonderful thing and strongly encouraged and beneficial to all who can participate, um, worship is not something that just happens in a place like this. Worship is all about living our lives before God, openly offered to him. Excuse me. I was feeling empowered, but apparently I'm not quite all there. All right, I think we got the mic going now. All right, thank you, Mike. I was rolling, I don't remember where I was rolling. Um, Yes, worship is not something that exclusively happens in a religious church building or something like that. It's all connected to what Jesus talked about. Love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength, in all of your circumstances and situations and relationships at home, at work, when you're playing and recreating in all the, in your neighborhood, all the different ways, if we love God with our whole being and love our neighbors as ourselves, this is worship. So again, good reminder of that video. Thank you, um, those that put it up there. We're continuing our series, um, focusing on Exodus and about um, we can make a world of difference in the world because God is the difference maker and he wants to make a world of difference in our own lives through Christ Jesus and the resurrection life that's available to us and through our lives to other people. And uh, I was kind of, uh, had a funny circumstance this week that kind of reminded me, you know, well, we'll get there in a minute, but one of the ways that God wants, uh, back in history, how when he was wanting to lead his people who had become slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years, and he wanted to lead them out into something better. It was an oppressive slavery, um, it was backbreaking, and... While they had started in Egypt, a very positive relationship for 100 or so years, it had changed and had now become more than 200 years, longer than the age of our country, 284 years. They were slaves in Egypt under their slave masters, and it was just backbreaking and oppressive. And God wanted to leave the imagery that God used to the leader who he chose to, I'm going to use this person to help lead them out of this slavery. And the imagery that was presented to them later was this idea of, I want to bring you out of slavery, out of bondage, out of a feeling of powerlessness, of no hope, of feeling hemmed in and just constrained and restricted to a land, and here's the imagery, a land flowing with milk and honey flowing with milk and honey. Now, that stuff is kind of, you know, easily accessible in our culture, but back then, in their situation and circumstance, a land flowing with milk and honey represented tremendous good. Tremendous good, because they lived in poverty. And so, milk represented sustenance, protein, you know, cheese, all the things that are related to milk that they didn't have much access to. And honey, honey from the honeycomb was a sweetness, a joy. You know, they just didn't have the full measure. And so God, when he wanted to paint a motivating picture, said, where I want to bring you, a reality I want to bring you into, is a land flowing with milk and honey. Remember, they lived in an arid part of the world, and they were worked extremely hard crushing, back-breaking labor. A land flowing with milk and honey represents where animals can feed and flourish, and again, have milk, bees and flowers and all that kind of stuff. It was very motivating. It was very inspiring. Something really they could only imagine or they may have heard about from generations before I was thinking about that this week, and I just brought in some examples as just a reminder to us. Milk. We can get this anywhere. 
you know, not readily available, not available at all where they were. You know, God chose to call this promised reality a land flowing of milk and honey. And I think that that should be a reminder to us that, you know, I think God has so favorably disposed to Wisconsin. Because we're really big into milk and dairy and all this stuff. I mean, look at all the stuff we've got here. We've got milk. He knew back then that there'd be half and half in a bottle. He knew that there would be yogurt of all kinds, sweetened, unsweetened, vanilla, all that stuff. He knew that there would be cheese, and not just any kind of cheese, but you can get it freshly grated, ready to sprinkle on. It brings savory and protein to whatever you want. He knew that there would be big hunks of cheese, mozzarella, which you can put on pizza or on salads or stuff like that. And he even knew that there would be good cheese. Oh, wait, that's Gouda. But it's still good. I visited my doctor last week, and I brought this up last time and forgot to talk to it, but my doctor has been taking care of people for a long time, and he does a really good job. I enjoy his company. I was surprised when I went to an appointment a couple weeks ago where there were stacks of honey over on the counter, and I read the little sign, and he's gotten into a hobby where he raises bees somewhere out in Delfield, and he's creating his own honey. And so here we have honey that was grown just about not grown, but you know, through bees, you get it. I, I saw you immediately giggle. <laughs> Produced six miles down the road. A land flowing, not sparse, but flowing with milk and honey. Things back then that would have been incredibly, incredibly wonderful to imagine and experience. And it's God's not just talking about. The, his land flowing with milk and honey that's just physical rea realities. He's talking about mental health. He's talking about physical health. He's talking about spiritual health, emotional health. This reality of being in a love relationship with him as opposed to under a taskmaster and a slave master. See, that's the difference between a relationship with Jesus Christ that God has intended. It's a love relationship with God based upon grace, based upon understanding, based upon compassion and care and loving sacrifice, as opposed to dominion and oppression of unachievable standards and that if you don't get it all right, you're going to be kicked off the island or you're going to suffer immeasurably. That's the difference. God, from the very beginning, has been calling every human person into a love relationship with him. I thought I was going to tell you a story where I may kind of make fun of myself, but I think I won't. because I just want to make, Maybe I'll tell it at the end. Um, so, before we go further, we all encounter things that are or appear bigger than us. Circumstances in our places of work, circumstances in relationships, circumstances in health, in our health. Things sometimes we can f see them coming and we can get anxious and nervous. Sometimes things come out of the blue and ambush us and we had no idea they were coming and we don't. These are things that can inspire fear. They can inspire all manner of reaction of just detaching and pulling away. And one of the things that's so great about the scriptures is that God understands this. And one of the reasons we know, wants to help us, one of the reasons we know is through what we're seeing with the people of Israel who had a good thing going. But then it became bondage and slavery, and they felt powerless, they felt helpless. They were. They could not have extricated themselves. But God was not, but God was aware of what was going on and decided to do something. And the way God does is He works through human beings. And so this should be an encouragement to all of us. And whatever challenges that we're facing right now, whatever difficulties, whatever things that we might be drawn toward that we're not sure we can do it or it's too much for us or what are the risks, all this kind of stuff, God can speak to us where we're at 
in all the different phases of our life through his hand in the life of Moses and his people. So let's pray, and we'll get into the heart of the message. Lord, thank you. Because you're God of the universe, because you are, you have been, you always will be, that you are the eternal one, because you dwell in all time and all space, and you know absolutely everything, Lord, you know us, you know what we need, you know how to help us, not just live our lives better, but to bring benefit in the world that blesses other and adds to your name. Lord, you know all these things. And Lord, you want to bring good. You want to share your goodness with us and help us to be sharers of your goodness. Thank you for the amazing hope, the amazing power that is available in a love relationship with you through Jesus Christ. And Lord, thank you for millennia. You've been demonstrating this. And it's been written down. And because they're words of eternal life, they will be relevant to any person in any generation, in any culture, in any language, because they're your words. The creator and sustainer of the universe and the one who knows all and who loves all and wants all to experience himself. So Lord, thank you that you know who we are, you know where we're at, and you want to lead us forward wonderfully in that love relationship we mentioned, proven in Jesus' incarnation, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. Lord, would you speak through your Holy Spirit and through your living and active scriptures, reach us where we're at and where we need to be. Thank you that you love us. Lord, make your words come alive that we may leave from this place encouraged, strengthened, to love you with all of ourselves and to love others as ourselves in the worlds that we live in. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, as I mentioned, that uh, they, the Israelites were in Goshen, the region of Goshen in Egypt, for 430 years. The first 146 years were wonderful. The next 284 years were not, where they became oppressed and slaves, and it was very difficult. Moses came on the scene toward the end of that oppression, and he was in Egypt, and then in Midian, a total of about 80 years, and it was at that point that God brought him out of Midian, called him, and said, you know, I want to use you, Moses. You know Egypt. You're part of that realm. I'm going to bring you here, and you're going to help. You're going to be my instrument to help. And a way to summarize those that discussion that we talked on last week is on the top of the page there. Just imagine this, and this is my shorthand of the conversation between God and Moses. God saying to Moses, I've seen and heard the misery and the suffering of the Israelites. I will rescue them. I'm going to bring them, as I mentioned, into a land flowing with milk and honey. Something very good, very positive, a, a whole new reality that they have not experienced. God to Moses specifically. I'm sending you to Pharaoh and to the Israelites. Moses, who am I to face Pharaoh and the Israelites? How can I face Pharaoh? He's so powerful. How can I help the Israelites? They're not even going to recognize me. God's response, I will be with you, Moses. It's important as we go a little further, you know, this whole thing was God's idea, not Moses. You know, oftentimes we approach God with our list of ideas and things that we want to happen, and that's kind of how we can approach God. And it's okay to mention to God what you'd like to see happen, what you want. That's totally fine. But if our relationship with God is exclusively, God, here's what I want you to do for me. Make it happen according to my timetable. Smooth all the roads. Take care of everything so that my life is exactly the way I want it. That's not a good relationship, is it? That's more like, I'm God, and God, would you kind of be my helper? You know, Moses had spent 40 years in Egypt, 
And then when he saw the oppression of the people, the people of his birth origin and birth family, when he saw the oppression, he tried to do something about it violently, got in trouble, and he had to flee. And he spent 40 years in a foreign region in Midian, and life was pretty good there. Life was a little slower than the hubbub of, of Egypt. The conspiracies and the power struggles in the palace, no more for him. He had a wife. He had a father-in-law who had a good, you know, sheeping business, shepherding business. And he spent 40 years there, married, had a couple kids. It was good. It was quiet. Things were going well. And then God tapped Moses on the shoulder figuratively through the burning bush and said, Hey, this is me. And I know that you know, you, you, maybe you've forgotten. You've had 40 years of it pretty nice here in Midian, and there's been things I've been accomplishing in you, but maybe you've forgotten about, but I see what's going on there, and I'm really concerned about them, and I want to use you to make a difference. So this was God's idea, and Moses was very reluctant, very fearful, as we're seeing. I'm sending you. Oh, I don't know that I can talk to Pharaoh. Oh, the Israelites, they'll never listen to me. That was the first example of Moses' reticence and his fearfulness. Continuing, Moses says to God, Suppose the Israelites that they don't think I'm credible. Suppose that they think I've made this whole thing up that I'm not really coming from you. And God says, I am who I am, Moses. Tell them the I am has sent you. I am means the fully present, faithful one. I'm fully present and I'm faithful to my promises. The promises that I made through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in this generation. God goes on to talk about how you know, Pharaoh is into power. He's going to say, no, I can handle that. At the end, God says, I will compel Pharaoh. I will show Pharaoh power. I'll compel him by my power. And that's where we pick up the story in Exodus chapter 4. Already Moses has shown two different ways of being, eh, I'm not so sure, God, I'm not, I don't think I'm your guy. Uh, what about these circumstances? We start right away with, there's going to be a total of five. Five times Moses tries to back out, him and haw, get, in, get out of this. Again, God's idea, not Moses, initially. Follow along in verses 1 through 5. Moses answered God, What if they don't believe me, the Israelites, and listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is in your hand, Moses? And Moses had a, a stick or a staff, a walking stick. What is in your hand, Moses? A staff, he replied. And the Lord said, Throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground, and it turned into a snake. And it scared the heck out of Moses, and he ran from it. You know, I'm not big into snakes, but you know, if, a, if the thing that I was walking with turned into a snake at my feet, I'd probably do the same thing. He ran from it. Then God said, Moses, don't be afraid. Reach out your hand and grab the snake by the tail. Right. <laughs> Good plan, God did. But he did. And the snake turned back into a walking stick, into a staff. And the Lord said, then, then the Lord said, this is so that they, the Israelites that you're really concerned about, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to you. Apparently, God could tell that this wasn't a good enough thing. To, he's trying to give Moses some credibility. He's trying to give Moses some confidence that if you can do a few things, that you'll show them that you're connected. It's not just you, that you're connected to Almighty God. Verse 6, he continues. He said, Moses, do this. Put your hand inside your cloak. Puts his hand inside his cloak. Says, pull it out. In his hand, the skin comes out all white and, and it's described as leprous. It's not necessarily leprosy, which was a terrible wasting skin disease back then. Um, it still exists in the world, uh, not so much in our region, but in other parts of the world. It's a terrible disease. It's, this may have been actual leprosy or something similar. You know, I'm sure it startled Moses. You know, this is a bad thing. Then God says, put your hand back in your cloak. And pull it out again, and it comes back, it's, the flesh is fully restored. 
What God is doing here with Moses, he's not just giving him tricks. He's helping Moses know that inanimate object, that stick, I have power over inanimate objects. I just turned it into a snake. You, your person, your hand, I have power in that realm as well. He's trying to help Moses understand that he's got resources. He has a benefactor way greater than he has ever. Remember, Moses did not grow up worshiping God, does not have much experience with God. Remember, the first 40 years of his life, remember he got instruction from his birth parents, probably the first four or five years of his life. And so, he, But for 35 years, he'd been in the court of Pharaoh in Egypt. That wasn't who he was. Yeah, 40 years with Jethro may have helped some. But again, he doesn't have much personal experience with God. You know, and some of us can say that, can't we? Even if we've been walking with God for two years or one year or five years, sometimes we can be like, I don't have much experience. You know, it's, I, I don't know you that well. And so God's helping him see that God has power and capability in all the realms and to help him with his confidence that you're not there alone. Remember what he had said to him, I will be with you, Moses. Continuing on in verse 9, if they don't believe these two, this is God speaking to Moses, if they don't believe these two signs or listen to you, I want you to do this. Go to the Nile River. Now remember, this is a very arid region. The Nile is the lifeline of Egypt. Most of the activity, flourishing activity, is within a few miles either side of the Nile because it waters and things can grow. Further away from that, it's barren, it's desert. So the Nile is the lifeline of Egypt. It goes through this narrow band through the length of Egypt, flowing from south to north into the Mediterranean. It says, go to the Nile, take some water from it, and in their presence, pour it on the ground, and it will turn to blood right there on the ground. You know, if the staff into the snake doesn't get their attention, you know, if the, the leprosy with the hand doesn't get your attention, people pay attention to instant blood, don't they? Something about blood, it'll get their attention, I promise you. Again, he's helping Moses with his confidence and his demonstration of mastery that God has capability beyond him. And believe me, you take a cup of water on the lifeline of your nation and pour it on the ground and it becomes blood, you're going to have, get, have people's attention. But still, Moses is struggling. Still, he's look at verse, we're going to read now verses 10 through 17. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon me, God. Pardon your servant, Lord. But I've never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you've spoken to me now. I'm slow of speech and tongue. Think for a minute. Have you ever been in a circumstance where you feel overwhelmed by your ability to communicate compared with others or in a certain situation? Moses is saying... Pardon me, God. Again, this is another, uh, having problems here. Pardon me, God. I've never been someone who's good with words. Not in the past. And, you know, now I'm in your presence, but I, I don't really feel any greater capability. It's not, I, I'm not sure you're going to make a difference here with this thing that's true about me, God. Again, never been eloquent. Neither in the past or even now that I'm in your presence. I'm slow of speech until you've you got to realize what you're dealing with here, God. Well, God does realize what he's dealing with, with Moses and with everyone in the room and everyone who's in earshot. In verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, Moses, who? Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them either deaf or mute? 
Able to hear or not hear? Able to speak or not speak? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Who's in charge of the senses and the capabilities and abilities? Is it not I, the Lord? Moses, you don't quite understand who you're talking with here. It is I, the Lord. And he continues on. So go. I want you to go and follow what I've told you and, and do what I want, what I've told you to do. Now go, and I will help you speak. And I will teach you what to say. But Moses said, okay, so we're, we've done, we've gone through four now. Uh, not me, God. Now we're at number five. But Moses said, uh, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. He's pretty direct now. <laughs> it's not, well, I don't have the bit. It, it's, it's, I don't want to. Pick somebody else. And we know it's because he's afraid. He feels incapable. The job looks too big for him. He can't even imagine confronting the king of Egypt and leading. You know, he, he knows there's lots of people there now. Leading a lot of people out. God, please choose somebody else. Verse 14, it said, Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. God's getting a little tired of Moses not trusting his words and the different things and encouragements that God... God, God knows is the guy. This is the guy. Come on, Moses, get with the program. It says, The Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said... Okay, what about your brother? What about Aaron? Aaron the Levite. Now remember, Moses was part of the family. Aaron, an older brother. Miriam, an older sister. But they stayed living with the Hebrews. Remember, Moses was put in a basket and a princess of Egypt who probably was without child took pity on him and though he was raised in this own birth household for four or five years he then became her son and grew up in a whole different environment so Aaron is more familiar with Hebrew customs the God of the Bible because it's what he grew up his whole life and as a Levite he was part of the priestly family so God's like okay you seem to be lacking confidence here. I'm a little frustrated, I'm angry, but I have an idea. What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You know, again, Aaron hasn't seen him in a long, long time. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will help both of you. Speak, and we'll teach you what to do. And he will speak to the people for you when you go to talk to the Israelites. And it will be as if he were your mouth, and if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so that you can perform signs with it as needed. Go back to that last line, verse 16. It will be as if. Aaron will be your mouth, and you will be like God to him. He's not saying, Moses, you're going to become a God. He's saying, Moses, I'm going to deal with you. And then you're going to pass it on to Aaron, who will speak in certain circumstances. So we've now gone through five, five times that Moses has backed away from God, had the focus, I can't handle it. And finally, he's very direct and just said, please send someone else. This is, I, I'm, I'm really, I just want to go into a shell right now. Raise your hand if you've ever been in a circumstance, in your work, health-wise, your home, your finances, relationship, where you just, it wasn't going, it seemed too great for it, and you just wanted to go into a shell. Raise your hand. Come on, admit it. Admit it to yourself. Admit it to each other. Yes. No one's going to think differently. Yes. Because this is, this is what happens in a difficult world. And God says, I don't, Moses, I, I can't leave you in the shell. I love you too much. There's so many wonderful things ahead for you in relationship with me. Okay, we'll bring Aaron along. 
He's going to help you through this. Three takeaways. Three takeaways from this passage that I think encourages us. First of all, God, this idea that God is always greatly present. See, we have a tendency to focus exclusively on our abilities, the things that we can see, our past track record exclusively, or focus on our circumstances, and if they seem somewhat favorable or familiar to us, but, but when it's unknown, when we haven't experienced it yet, we can tend to be really fearful, or we can tend to be able to un, unable to see beyond our own mental or physical limitations. But God wanted Moses to know, and God wants all of us to know, that God is always greatly present. Because God is great. God is fully present. There's nothing going on in your life or anyone else's life that God doesn't... Nothing surprises God. God is not caught off guard ever. Hear me say it again. God is not caught off guard ever and starts wringing his hands and wondering, what am I going to do? Oh, no. No, that we do that. Don't we? And God said, you don't need to waste time doing that. Remember that I am always fully present and I am greatly present. And if you'll be in this love relationship with me, you're going to be involved in things that you can never imagine in positive ways. And there's going to be a richness and fullness in your life with me and the people that you never imagined. So the first takeaway is that God will help us overcome our fears and our weaknesses. God is committed to that for our own, you know, again, because our fears and our weaknesses can kind of become at times like Egyptian slave masters and taskmasters that whip us and lash us and point up that we can never do enough and just want to beat us into the ground, right? God's not in for that. He wants to lead us beyond that to a land with milk, and you know the honey with it. So again, whatever your weaknesses are, whatever your fears are, and some of our fears are legitimate. We've experienced some rough stuff or some failures. Some of our fears are overblown. Some of our weaknesses, yeah. Guess what? Everyone has weaknesses. But that doesn't mean that you can't make a difference in the world and that God is going to say, well, you know, you're just too weak for me to care about or be interested in and, and to, you know, work in your life or through your life. God will help us overcome our fears and our weaknesses that want to make us into slaves with no hope, beaten down, and terribly restricted. Second, God asks us, and it's an ask, because God has given every human being free will. We're made with dignity in, in, in God's image. We have dignity and value, and we get, we get the power of choice given to us by God. And so God asks. He asks us to focus to focus on his ability, his greatness, his constant abiding presence, to focus on that above our limitations or above what we perceive as the limitations of the circumstances. Focus on the greatness of his ability and his constant faithful presence. You know, remember when God says, I am? It means I'm faithfully present all the time. But whether or not you experience that is up to you. Whether you'll connect with me. I'm always there. And if you want to go on your own and just dismiss me or not pay, well, you can do that, but you'll do better, and the people around you will do better if you recognize my faithful, constant presence that wants to help. I'm always there. So he asks us to focus on his ability, the greatness of his abilities and our limits. And third, God wants us to team up with complementary others. Remember? The whole thing was getting too much for Moses. It's like God was with a fire hose and said, go ahead, drink Moses. This is what's going to happen. This is what I... And he had too much. He's like, you know, just get somebody else. 
I'm out. And God got frustrated and angry with Moses, but he was compassionate. He said, you know, this is a lot. How about Aaron? You, you know, you're, you're, you're very self-conscious about your speaking. Aaron's a good speaker. He's your brother. Team up with Aaron. See, that's what it means to team up with complementary. You can spell complementary two different ways. This way of spelling complementary is, you know, someone has strengths that you don't, you have strengths that they don't, and because there's difference, you, when you pair together, you've got a really good team. And, and marriages and friendships and things like that can, can work that way. The other way of spelling complementary is, you know, just saying positive things. Which, that's good too. But this complementary is, Aaron's different than you. I've made him different than you. You guys will be a good team. And see, God wants us to team up with other people that aren't perfect either, and that have their own weaknesses. One of the joys of my adult life has been consistently long before I was a pastor, being in a small group of men, and with some women sometimes, studying the scriptures, sharing life, encouraging, building. It, it is a lifeline for me. Totally. Because we can be real with each other. We can learn about God together and help one another be encouraged and to compliment. So many times when we're talking about the scriptures and, and someone, someone will bring up something and I'm like, I hadn't seen that. That's really great. That's one of the beautiful things about connecting with the scriptures with others because God shows people different things from different angles. Or, or you know what, I'm wrestling with this situation at home or this is going on with my car or my finances and then someone will chirp it out. You know, hey, I have some experience in that. God wants us. The body of Christ is about teaming up with others in complementary relationships so that we all benefit. Amen? Yeah. So again, Moses helps us. We see that, you know, if you know a whole lot about Moses, he wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, etc. He wrote them, God. You, but here we are at the very first phases how did this guy become that guy? And wherever you're at right now, God's like, hey, here's where you're at now. I can bring you here. I can bring you there. Moses is an example. Because I love you. I'm not a taskmaster. I'm not a slave master. I want to be involved in a relationship of love with you that brings great benefit to you and you become a conduit of my love in the world around you. God wants to help us know the greatness of his presence all the time, no matter the difficulty, no matter what weaknesses you wrestle with. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are always present and that your presence is truly great and beyond our imagination and scope in terms of love, in terms of compassion, in terms of care. But Lord, we struggle with embracing that. We get so focused on our own weaknesses or difficulties that we've had in the past, or the threatening nature of circumstances, and we can get tunnel vision and not see the opportunities before us. Lord, would you help us? Lord, if we're struggling with finances, Lord, would you help us turn to you? Lord, if we're struggling in a significant relationship with communicating or forgiving or whatever, Lord, would you help us? Lord, if we're facing a health issue, something that's new and unexpected and came out of nowhere, if it's an ongoing nagging thing that makes it harder, even if these things and many others feel so much bigger than us, Lord, you are bigger than them. And you will never leave us. That you will always be present. And your greatness can transform us from within. In addition to the circumstances outside. That is the greatness of your love for us. And every human person. So Lord, thank you. Lead us forward. 
where we're at, where we're struggling, or where we may struggle or feel overwhelmed down the road. That's your pleasure. That's your good pleasure so that we can get out of slavery and help others as well get out of slavery. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and we will sing our closing song with the worship team.